Hey, welcome back to Chips and Salsa. I'm Crobe. I'm Jerry. Jerry. Hey, Jerry. <laughs> what? Jerry, you know what time it is? Yep. It's Patch Tuesday! <laughs> and we are going to have an amazing... I think this is going to be our best show yet. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> today we released three advisories. And let's go ahead and pull up our little presentation little presentationator. Yeah. So three advisories addressing six vulnerabilities. And ahead in our show, we're going to talk with the Intel uh, security researchers who originally found the issue in Intel SA00689 uh, about their findings. While we were preparing for our mitigation strategy of public disclosure, we received a report from a group of academic researchers about the same issue. And we're lucky enough to have the two of them join us here today and talk about their, their research. Yeah, it's going to be really great to talk to them. So here are the three advisories that we released and specific to Intel SA00615, Intel processors, MMIO stale data advisory. Customers need to know that in addition to the microcode update addressing this at the hardware level, they will need to also apply updates from their operating system uh, and or hypervisor vendors to complete the mitigation. Yeah, it's, it's not uncommon when you have a hardware mitigation that requires some software components to help complete the fix, right? Uh, no, we see these periodically. It just means that you know both a hardware and a software component uh, form the best solution to mm -hmm. mitigate the issue. And we collaborate with software vendors uh, you know, who have a part in this mitigation to, you know, help make this available today. Excellent. So moving on to Intel SA00645, this is the Intel Processors MMIO Undefined Access Advisory, which might sound similar to 00615, but it's slightly different. Um, this one does not have a mitigation, but rather Intel's providing guidance for those managed multi-tenant virtualized environments that are affected. Yeah. We've released uh, several tech papers associated with today's advisories, and the easiest way to find them is to visit our blog at the link below and also in the show notes. And finally, moving on to 00698, this is also software guidance only. Uh, the guidance is for cryptography implementations. It's important to note that cryptography implementations that are not vulnerable to power side channel attacks are also not vulnerable to this issue. Yeah. Uh, two other things that are important to note about this one is that the behavior is not architecture specific and any modern CPU that has dynamic power and thermal management is potentially affected. So pretty much all CPUs really. Uh, the second thing for customers to keep in mind about this one, um, like some other side channel issues, we don't believe that this attack is practical outside of a tightly controlled lab environment. Yeah, and, and you see this with a lot of side channel attacks. They require very exact and controlled conditions that just don't exist in the real modern network out in the real world. Yeah, but regardless, it was still a good find by both mm -hmm. our internal researchers and the academic folks. Um, always great to see uh, good research happening, and we're going to uh, speak with all of these folks today to, about their research. That's awesome. I'm looking forward to this. But let's get started. Um, let's talk with first our amazing Intel researchers, Chen Liu and Nir Rogel. Welcome to the show, guys. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about your work here at Intel? Chen, let's start with you first. Sure. Uh, my name is Chen Liu. I'm an offensive security researcher at Intel uh, since I joined in 2016. So I mostly work in uh, security topics across different uh, market segments, in, uh, mostly focusing on power management related to security issues. Excellent. And how about a little bit about yourself, Nir? Uh, my name is Nir Rogel. I'm 20 plus years in security uh, with Intel for the past few and I uh, work closely with Chen as an offensive security researcher interested in infrastructural topics, including power management. Right on. Uh, so can you guys tell us, you know, so we released this advisory today, uh, Intel SA00698. Uh, can you tell us in simple terms what it is 
you found and why you were looking at this particular area uh, other than this seems to be your focus of research area? Okay, maybe let me get started. Um, so we start this uh, research on power management since 2019 and the, uh, we were first working on the, uh, uh, the, the, the some telemetry side channel attacks uh, using rapid energy counters and which also uh, reported by external researchers by to Intel and the, now, now well, well known as platypus attack. So in the uh, following a uh, follow-up research of the of the of the telemetry security side channel, we found uh, there's another uh, similar but uh, 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 different but a similar effect that uh, can be used to perform this, some side channel attack. And basically, this is the uh, a side channel that could convert a power side channel into a frequency side channel, and also observed can be observed by attack. Uh, by observing the timing difference of the program. So then later we got the report from external researchers, uh, which tell uh, that they also found the same vulnerability. And the uh, interesting aspect here in these vulnerabilities is that they're uh, not specified in the logic per se, rather in how the processor and all modern processors, not just Intel's, uh, will manage their power budgets, physical attributes, and parameters of the computation. Right. And this is the, a, a well accepted and uh, yeah, well accepted the concept by the academia industry that the power side channel is an in inherent property of the CMOS circuit. And the, this, uh, the new part of that side channel is it's, uh, it's actually leveraging in power management algorithms that are uh, leveraged by most of the modern processors that converts the power difference to a timing difference. And so the power signature of a given workload, including cryptographic workloads, uh, is acted upon by the processor in its attempts to throttle frequency. And that action is observable by certain adversaries uh, requiring uh, a mitigation uh, to prevent information leakage. Well, that, that's a good segue. Let's talk about the mitigation a little bit. What is it uh, that we're asking cryptographic implement implementations to do? Uh, we first want to uh, emphasize this, some prerequisite for this attack to be possible. The first is that the, the software implementation needs to be vulnerable to power side channel. That is saying, if the, in other words, if it's not vulnerable to power side channel, or there's already some mitigations applied to against power side channel, then it is uh, likely that it will not impacted by this side channel. And secondly, the uh, the system needs to hit a certain reactive limit uh, while executing the victim workload, so that the power management algorithm will convert the power difference to a timing difference. And last but not the least. The attacker will need to have the capability of reading the signature, which here is the frequency or timing dif timing difference, uh, with a, enough uh, resolution, so that the, the attacker can deduce a secret from that. So in Intel's uh, mitigation uh, or our target on this prerequisite, and we release a, a guidance for the cryptography implement implementation, including the library owners and the application owners to review and harden the code if needed. So the first, of course, the first step we would recommend people to do is to read through the, uh, the guidance we publish and assess the codes and see if they're vulnerable based on this prerequisites. If they believe the code is vulnerable and they believe uh, mitigation is needed, then we recommend them to first considering applying the, the, the common uh, techniques that against power, uh, power side channels. So as we know, power side channel has been a research area for more than more than 20 years. So there are tons of solutions that have been proven to be effective. But, uh, but uh, uh, we also know that um, uh, many of them are really uh, algorithm specific. So there are some, some techniques, for example, masking would be, uh, be proven to be uh, useful against the certain uh, cryptography algorithms on the software level. And for the cryptography applications who can manage their keys, we recommend them to considering 
do uh, do the do a key refresh uh, uh, based on the needs of uh, of the security requirements and also the, the the need of the application. So that's to prevent the attacker from getting enough information before the key expires. It, right. It's interesting you mention uh, prerequisites. So thinking about um, kind of a non academic non lab scenario. How challenging would this be to execute this attack in a real network, in a real environment? That's a good question. So, yeah. So, uh, based on the uh, based on the, the our internal research and the report from external researcher, it is really takes quite a long time to uh, recover a secret key from the cryptography algorithm, which made the like, environment it takes hours to days. And the, the, the basically the, the reason is that there is uh, the signal to noise ratio, uh, which is a connect term we typically use in the, uh, in the session analysis, which the, we, we means like a higher signal to noise ratio means the attacker will need less time to get information. So in, in, in this attack, if we compare the signal to noise ratio uh, versus the traditional power side channel, it is much, much lower than the physical based traditional power side channel. This is mainly because the signal is due is is coming from the average power consumption of the victim program running in a certain time window, and the time window is much much longer than a typical uh, cryptography workload. So, in order to get the signal, the attacker needs to repeat the victim program over and over during the window, for like for tens, hundreds, or even millions of times to get enough signal. Even in that case, the um, relatively low resolution of the energy uh, of the energy reporting, and also and uh, further being converted to to time difference, will further reduce the signal to noise ratio. Not to mention there is systematic noise during the data collection and uh, the the uh, energy counter aggregation. So overall, we um, consider like so in a, in a lab environment, is that it is possible to do uh, using this the technique to recover secret keys from cryptography application, but the risk of the uh, attacker using that in a real environment is is really low. Thank you for that clarification. That's very helpful. So, what else uh, is included in uh, Intel's mitigation guidelines? And uh, one other uh, mitigation that uh, can work in certain cases is uh, also documented in literature, uh, the introduction of uh, noise into the computation. And so as the uh, processor or engine, cryptographic engine perhaps, uh, is uh, consuming power and toggling the uh, transistors, we may be inserting uh, dummy instructions or computations using dummy keys in the most generalized form uh, to essentially mask the signature of the uh, true key and, and true computation. And, and so cryptographic library owners uh, are, are able to um, uh, inject the sufficient level of noise that would suit a given security application. And uh, Intel has a, an example of this uh, due to come out with uh, Intel IPP crypto libraries. Yeah, that makes yeah. sense. That's and interesting. one smaller bullet is that we also recommend the, uh, the, uh, the uh, a cloud service provider to consider the to considering not to expose a certain uh, interfaces that, that allow the the VM to arbitrarily changing the reactive limits, so that the prevents the uh, reactive limits from uh, being um, uh, exploited by attacker in the VM to make the the, the throttling behavior ha from happening. Good point about policy configuration and security configuration management. It's nice that you thought through so many different uh, options and you have a lot of a lot of variety that somebody could address this. Right. Yeah, and we also also want to point out that uh, uh, because the fundamental root cause of this side channel is still the power side channel, and which is uh, recognized by the industry and uh, uh, academia is a not to e not easy to solve problem, and because it's inherent property of the CMOS circuit. So and uh, we're so we're not expecting this problem being fully resolved until someday we like people find it. So there's a perfect way to solving the power center power center problem. Yeah, um, that leads to an interesting question. So 
the, is it just Intel platforms that are affected by an issue like this? No, DVFS mechanisms for dynamic uh, frequency and voltage scaling have been in use uh, throughout industry and are in fact codified in a sense in the ACPI standard. So ACPI standard defines uh, P states, performance states, and those are uh, implemented uh, using these uh, abilities to switch uh, frequency and, and voltage of given computing uh, elements or computing units within an SOC. And, and so the techniques have, have been known for uh, quite some time, a couple of decades at least, uh, from Sandy Bridge, if uh, anyone cares about that history, uh, but um, from uh, uh, the, the security perspective, we're now learning more about those kinds of implications for uh, processors that uh, try to implement uh, better and better isolation. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and uh, so based on the internal research and also the external research, so as we we know, that not only Intel system got impacted uh, by this type of attack. So there's at least another vendor the system also confirmed to be to be impacted, and we are expecting this is a uh, this is a, a, this this kind of attack will be generally applicable to the modern CPUs that are leveraging the modern power management algorithms. And this vendor has been notified, of course, as part of coordinated vulnerability disclosure and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, the technical details, experimental data uh, will, will be available uh, in, in uh, uh, paper. Well, that was great. Uh, thank you guys for all of your hard work on this and for the uh, collaboration coordination across the industry. Any final points for us today? Yeah, so I think we'll maybe if so. It's on the, 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 the current research trend in the industry and academia. We see the power management security being an uh, emerging topic that people used to uh, people uh, uh, used to like ignore it or pay less attention on it. So now with the, uh, the, the, the all this new type of so power related attacks, we believe that is something that the security researcher would uh, would pay more. We would need to pay more attention. And also, but, but also our uh, designers and architectures were also to learn more about what are the new vulnerabilities that are impacting or can be uh, caused by this uh, power management algorithms. You stole my conclusion, which is that uh, the intersection between security and uh, building uh, performant, energy efficient uh, processors, those two fields are, are sort of uh, finding one another and they uh, are, are sort of recognizing the, the challenges and we, we look forward to seeing more innovation. Well, that was uh, awesome information from Chin and Nir. Now uh, let's talk to the two academic researchers who also discovered this issue, Ying Chen Wang and Ricardo Pacagnilla. Let's cut to them. Yeah. Ying Chen and uh, Ricardo, welcome to the show. Uh, we're glad that you can join us today to talk about your research. Can you first uh, introduce yourselves and tell us, you know, what university you're from and about your field of study? Okay, sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Ying Chen. I'm a PhD student at University of Texas at Austin. I work in applied cryptography and hardware security. My research focused on side channel attacks and cryptanalysis. And my name is Ricardo. Thank you for having us. And I am a PhD student at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And my research is in hardware security. Right on. That's awesome. Definitely need more people researching hardware security. That's awesome to hear. Mm -hmm. So our, our purpose today is um, you published a paper titled Hertz Bleed, uh, Turning Power Side Channel Attacks into Remote Timing Attacks on x86. Could you both share with us kind of a high level overview of this research? Yes, absolutely. So modern Intel processors that you can buy on the market today, they have this feature called dynamic frequency scaling. And what this means is that when you run a program on one of these processors, the frequency of the processor can vary depending on a number of factors. It's not fixed. So what we found in this research is that the frequency of the processor depends on the data that the programs are computing on. For example, if you have a program that is performing some arithmetic computations, 
if the program is computing on some numbers, the frequency of the processor might be different than if the program was computing on some other numbers, depending on the bits in those numbers. And uh, the reason why this is important for security is that uh, a lot of the industry practices for constant time programming, which is uh, how, to how to write secure code for cryptographic libraries, they rely on an assumption, which is that the timing of instructions does not depend on data. But when the frequency of the processor can vary depending on data, then programs can take a different time to execute depending on the data. And so this breaks that fundamental assumption that is made by constant time programming. And we, we showed uh, some security implications in our paper that uh, I'll, uh, I'll let Ying Chen describe. Okay, so uh, inside our paper, we attack a cryptography protocol called Psyc, super singular isogeny key encapsulation. It is a post-quantum key encapsulation mechanism inside, um, inside the NIST competition round three. It is an alternate candidate. Inside our paper, we show that it is possible to turn a power side channel leakage into a remote timing attack over the network without any co residency We report this vulnerability to the state-of-art implementation of Psyche, which is from Microsoft and Cloudflare. And they both deploy, is going to deploy a mitigation for our vulnerability. Thank you. Well those are some pretty cool findings. What what led you uh, to look into this particular area? Oh, we um, we approach this program from different angles. For myself, me and my advisor at UT Austin, we actually started to work on a side channel called Silent Zero Store. It is inspired by a blog post from Travis Downs in uh, spring 2020, and we did uh, we tried to look into the security implementation of silence or store on cryptography protocols. And we surveyed a bunch of cryptos and we found this psych thing that we never heard of before is actually vulnerable to silence or store. And all experiments work well. It goes well inside our Gym 5 simulator inside on the real machine. And later we find out it is actually not just due to silence or store. The psych is vulnerable to this timing side channel because of frequency scaling. And that's how we met Ricardo. Yes, on, on our end, uh, we are the team at UIUC. And the way we approached this problem was we were trying to think of the sources of data dependent leakage on modern hardware. And so our question was, uh, is frequency one of these sources? Does frequency behave in a data dependent way? And so we started running a lot of experiments in uh, like early in uh, spring 2021. And we were trying to figure out what, uh, under what circumstances the frequency can depend on data. So for example, an experiment we ran was uh, running the integer multiplication in, uh, in a loop and then trying to change the contents of the source registers to this integer multiplication computation. And what we saw is that the frequency of the processor and therefore the time that it took to compute that computation was different depending on the, the contents of those registers. And then we started exploring more and we later found that this is broader and uh, we met with the UT Austin people and uh, we later wrote this paper, which is called Hertz Bleed. That's cool. Um, so when you're doing this research, do you conduct experiments on just one platform or multiple platforms? And depending on what you find, um, how do you report this to other platforms that could also be impacted? That's a great question. So initially, uh, both our teams were focusing on Intel platforms because just, just what we had in our labs. But we later tried to reproduce these on other processors, like the AMD processors, and we found that they're also vulnerable. So we reported the, our vulnerability to them as well. That's great. Um, so my understanding is that the fidelity of the data and the timing requirements make this a pretty difficult attack uh, or an attack that takes a really long time. Do you see this being uh, practical outside of a lab environment? Uh, so we think it is practical attack because first it only takes 36 hours to extract a secret key inside the post-quantum crypto system. 
and we try to run that experiment with a clean with a machine free of noise, and we also try to run the experiment with a machine has background noise. And we found that even with background noise on the machine, it is actually not going to prevent our attack because the background noise helps the machine to get into a state which we call steady state in our paper that make our attack even easier to launch. Well, so, yeah, so as part of your research and then your disclosure to vendors like Intel, um, ideally we share um, kind of how we're planning on fixing it. So what are your thoughts about the mitigations around this problem? Um, to our knowledge, uh, the mitigations that Intel is suggesting are software-based mitigations, and uh, we are not aware of uh, microcode patches that are being released. And um, we think that these software-based mitigations that are recommended by the security advisory are uh, standard for mitigations against, for example, power side channels. But of course, our threat model is different, so it shows how it's important to deploy these mitigations, even to protect against attacks like Hertzbleed. I um, think I'll oh, go ahead. Yes, yeah, sir. I think the cryptography community needs to know this side channel very much mm -hmm. because uh, it is unclear how many cryptography protocols is vulnerable to this side channel. So they might want to take an inspection of their code and then try to think if they want to add some masking or noise into their data flow to protect themselves against this side channel. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, to, to add to that, there is um, a big takeaway from this research, which is that uh, the current practices for secure coding of cryptographic libraries are not sufficient to mitigate against timing attacks. And this is what our paper shows. Exactly. So that's what I like, uh, you know, elevating you know, knowledge, helping the ecosystem to uh, become more secure in general. It's awesome. Um, <clears throat> when you started doing this, type of research, did you think that one day you'd be reporting issues like this to companies like Intel? And you know what, what has that experience been like for you? Um, no, because uh, like at least from my point of view, we started with Silent Zero Store. So it's very hypothetical back to that time when we, when we first started that project. And for me, it's kind of amazing that we started from some completely unrelated side channel and then later we found out this like side channel called Hersbleed that has real world implication. And Intel put us in touch with the other group like Ricardo and we work together. So we have very different background and expertise and then we have very different view of the project and we help each other to make the work very great in the end. So uh, where and when do you plan to present this research? Uh, we're going to present this uh, Usenix security, the 31st one this year, uh, Austin, uh, sorry, at Boston during August 2022. It's an awesome conference. Thank you. Um, pretty nice for someone, you know, just starting out in your careers here. I think you guys have a long and uh, interesting road ahead of you as you continue your research. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jerry and I want to thank you both for your time today and, um, you know, just in general for your interest in this field. Um, before we wrap up, um, do you, either of you have any advice for students that were thinking about maybe entering this field of study? Yeah, I think uh, the, the best advice I can give is to try to surround yourself with people who are excited to work on topics that you're excited to work on too. And, uh, and who push each other to do great work. And that's how it was for us in this collaboration because we were both excited about this research and, uh, and it worked out really well. Well, that's awesome. Thanks uh, again for, for sharing with us today and uh, good luck with your presentation. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. And thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Woo, what an action-packed, information-filled uh, episode today, Jerry. We got some really great information from our guests. Yes, yeah, you know, really good uh, from a research perspective, interesting issue. Um, I think uh, a lot of folks will say this doesn't have a lot of big risk in the real world, but, um, you know, it's always good to see this kind of research. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and, and oftentimes an attack like this isn't practical outside of a lab environment, but research like this is invaluable to helping shape future processor design and also um, changes in software development, like around cryptographic libraries. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah, but bringing external researchers on the show was a, was a first for us, and it was a lot of fun. And not a last, I hope. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely think we should do this again. Uh, thanks to Chen and Nir for their technical insights, and thank you to Ying Chen and Ricardo for sharing their research with us today. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And that's a wrap for this episode of Chips and Salsa. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.